Uh, okay, does anybody have any questions, first of all? Um, I'll just leave it up to you for a second. There's only 13 of us here, but any, any questions? Excuse me, I'm blowing up. Sorry. All right. Anybody? No questions this morning? It's my usual crew, though. It's good to see everybody's faces unblocked. And I know you're all ready for a new semester of learning. Just kidding. <laughs> I think everybody is about <clears throat> as beat down at the end of this semester as I've seen people. So let's cross the finish line, like slide across the finish line on our backs. Something like, what's up? We'll do some something cool like that. Uh, since break dancing is going to be an Olympic sport, let's break dance across the finish. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, it is. Let's let's uh, let's break dance across the finish line. That's that's a little bit more my generation. Okay. Uh, no questions, so we're going to move forward. The makeup for exams one, two, and three was yesterday. Hopefully, you did that if you needed to. Um, tomorrow, this is our last class session. Um, tomorrow, uh, exam four opens up. Uh, <coughs> Yua, anything about that? Anything about anything, Yua? Well, the only thing about the exam is that it will open for several days, I guess, until Saturday morning or maybe 1 p.m. on Saturday. So you have a couple of days to finish that. Awesome. That sounds fantastic. Um, so please uh, make sure we've given you a little extra time. And I think that's, I, I like that idea. So I think it's fine. Let's give folks a little more time. That way I can put out a study guide today if you want to take it Friday. You can take it Friday, you've got enough time. And um, as usual, I wrap up a week before finals so that this is off your plate. You know, people have a lot of stuff to do anyway. So, um, all right, let's dig right back in with some questions for the last time today. Um, you sure there's no, no questions about anything? No? All right, well, I mean, we had an election on November 3rd, well over a month ago. Um, and we still have 88 congressional Republicans that have not uh, admitted defeat or conceded or admitted that the president, I mean, I guess they all won, but the president didn't. It's, it's gotten into sort of confusing soft coup land. Um, so anyway, I think that uh, I won't see you before this all wraps up, but this will wrap up and the next administration will come in. Um, and then there'll be just as much interesting sociology to do over the next four years or whatever. So. I guess the news is a little bit, I don't know, I think it's a little bit wild and, and wacky um, and dangerous, but, uh, but we're not here for that. We're, for the, we're here to talk about the environment, not at all wild and wacky and dangerous. So let's start with this morning's lecture. Okay, so I had some questions. I did put out a final round of Top Hat questions this morning. Thumbs up, everybody. At least go look at them if you have Top Hat. Um, I think one of the questions is about the undie run. If you've not heard of the undie run, it's kind of like a CSU tradition. We used to have co-ed naked soccer at Luther College campus where I uh, went to school. And so, I don't know, it was just an extra question, so I threw it in there. Um, and there is no right or wrong undie, undie run answer. Uh, but I put it up there and then we'll start to get those uh, figured out. Uh, the newest tab is that we're somewhere at around 6,300 pounds, 6,400, I think 6,400 pounds for food, uh, or sorry, we used to do this in pounds, $6,400, which is 12,800 meals. We are trying to get to 7,000 and we'll get 30 extra credit points or 35 extra credit points. Otherwise, you've already locked in the extra credit and that's looking good for everybody. James, any, um, any report on the baby front today, or are we good? All right, we're good. Okay, so list some concerns with the state of our natural world. And I'm just gonna kind of ramble these on. Um, we have 14 answers. My issue is people don't even care about the environment as being damaged by the behavior and they refuse to help attempt to fix the damage. Uh, limited and greatly diminished. Climate change, depleting resources, running out of room, extinction. It's an afterthought when compared to the advancement of human civilization. Diversity loss, climate change, effect on oceans, global warming, nature's dying, forest fires, so much pollution, environmental degradation such as soil, water pollution, global warming, wildfires, 
Climate crisis, keep our oceans clean, keep pollution and littering down, use of non-renewable resource or use of non-renewable products versus renewable, deforestation, use of fossil fuels, et cetera. And what is the one here? There we go. The advancement of human civilization. I'm not convinced <laughs> uh, that we're advancing. But I know the spirit in which that was said, like anything sort of, any industry or we're moving along for the advancement, right? Of, um, of humanity or of human civilization. Um, but that's obviously really compromised. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, would you be willing to eat less meat in order to slow climate change uh, or stress on the environment? 10 people said half as much. Two people said would stop eating meat. Two people, nope. So what do you think? Overwhelmingly, people in this class would eat half as much meat. Um, Make an observation. Why? Why not? Why would you? Why is it so important? What do you think? How have these numbers, how do you think these numbers have changed over time? Um, why would you be willing to eat half as much meat to slow climate change? Well, like, I don't eat any meat because I'm a vegetarian. So that was a super easy question for me. So I was like, already easy. there. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but I didn't start being a vegetarian because of the environmental reasons. Mm -hmm. That's just like a huge plus that I could like brag about. <laughs> right. What was your reason, if you don't mind me asking? So I watched a bunch of like documentaries and it was so disgusting and cruel and just so like traumatic to watch that I just couldn't. And I had a friend who was vegan, so I was like, I can be vegetarian. Right. And it is a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, Storm just saw a video recently on chicken production, how they just take the baby males and grind them up alive. They take and, and you know, slice off about three-fourths of the beak of the adult hens so that they don't peck each other. Um, so he was really appalled. And and definitely has a guy that didn't eat meat for years till he got chickens, then said he'd eat chicken only if it was our chickens or responsible or our eggs. Now, let me tell you, we'll do a little chicken thing this morning. All right, would you like to see some chicken eggs? There we go. All right. This is laid, this, these were laid just this morning. And here's the deal about chickens. They decide when they want to lay and when they don't. So they've got a, a, a nesting box, a laying box. Isn't that cool? Look at this one's like chocolate. Hold on. They're so different. But they, it's not just the dark that gets them to stop laying. We had babies in one room, and so we had the door shut. And even though they've got a laying box in the big room, they don't like that laying box. So they just stopped laying for like the last almost two months. I'm talking two eggs a day, one egg a day. Now, it's really interesting because people think chickens like have to lay eggs, right? Every day or two. If they don't want to lay eggs, if they don't feel like it in their head, they will not lay eggs. It's wild. Like we moved in our goat next door to them immediately the next day, this is years ago, the next day, no eggs. And we were getting like 20 eggs a day. We were getting about 20 eggs a day, 18 eggs a day. We put the babies in the one room and sequestered them and shut the door. They have their laying boxes, but they don't like them. So I was getting two eggs a day max for the last month or two months. So what I got last night, that's what I got last night, 18 eggs um, all at once because we opened the door. So, you know, you like to sit in the chair that you like to sit in or sleep in the bed that you like to sit in or to do the things you need to do. You have to have the right attitude. Chickens are exactly the same. And for anybody who hasn't really been around chickens, uh, come out to the farm sometime, you know, mask up, come out to the farm, check them out, spend some time with them. They're really uh, amazing animals. I guess I wouldn't have thought much about it, but we've had them now for like 10 years plus. Okay, so who else? Uh, stop eating meat. Why? Why not? What do you think? Why do you, it's like so many of my students are willing to even half their meat consumption. Um, but what did you answer and why? All right, I'm moving on. Uh, don't have time today, but there's other ones that you can chime in on. Are humans partially responsible for climate change or global warming? This is a right or wrong answer. And 14 people said yes, zero people said no. <clears throat> we are uh, very responsible 
for climate change as human beings. And we are in agreement 95 to 99% across the line in the scientific communities. One of the things that we have to talk about as sociologists then is why do so many people or who is left to convince or why is that the case? Um, when our world scientific community know that it's science and not a belief, how come so many people still can't sort of internalize that or, or come to grips with that? So, all right, this is the big one. Um, do you feel like fixing the environment is definitely possible? Maybe in my lifetime or impossible. Now, everyone answered definitely possible or maybe in my lifetime, half down the middle. I mentioned that this was a very, very, very important question. Why is this question so important? And why would half the people saying yes and half the people saying maybe make me so happy at 8.13 in the morning? What do you think? Respond to those numbers and why. Because if we already believe that we're just screwed, no one's gonna try to do anything more. Um, it's kind of essential to hope that we can at least do something because then people maybe will try. Um, but if we've already just given up, then we're, we are screwed. <laughs> good, good. Who else? I think that um, even if you believe that you can't fix it, um, we can definitely at least slow it down to where like this stage that we're at can be prolonged enough to where we can find other solutions to possibly fix it. Good. Yeah. Um, excellent. Look, I know there's, it's vague. I did that on purpose, right? I do that all the time, fixing the environment. Well, maybe it can't be fixed or back to where it was before humans, you know, 7 billion of us had an impact on this earth, but it's certainly, um, we can do something about it and we've shown that. Good. Uh, anybody else? Possible, somebody types, uh, Sophie type, possible, but not in my lifetime. We need to get our act together. We're not too far gone, but if we don't get together, we'd be screwed. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I love that. Get your act together. Um, okay, good. Uh, so not in our lifetimes, perhaps, which might make it a little bit more difficult to act if it's not going to, you know, drastically improve for us. You know, humans want to know that we're doing something, but still, yes, <clears throat> or at least a maybe. Anybody else? One more. Why this is so important. All right, cool. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's generally that piece, right? Human beings, um, if we think we can accomplish something and we've mentioned this, then I think we go about it. Um, and if we think that it is an impossible task, that is too much, uh, then we won't, or a lot of times we don't. And we can look at disaster behavior. A lot of times people freeze up in disaster behavior. If we look at human behavior in regards or relationship to disasters, um, People can freeze, they cannot act, they can think that it's too far gone um, to be able to do something about it. And then that manifests itself as real, right? And then 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And remember, this is not a political issue. It's interesting, yesterday when I was lecturing about the environment, one of my students, <clears throat> not so secretly, had their, she's from Texas and was talking about that, but her dad was sitting right next to her and you could kind of every once in a while see his shoulder and he's very, Skeptical, I guess I would say. He's more on the line of being um, suggestible by climate denial sort of um, <clears throat> attempts and things like that. But it was fun to have like a parent, um, maybe with a different idea or a different belief system in place, listen to the lecture yesterday. And we have to get, I guess, away from that. When I do my 220 day one, I'm like, first of all, this is not a belief. So if this is gonna cause anybody a lot of stress during the course of the semester, every single day to come in here and hear about science, then you should drop this class. Um, and that's the same way that I would approach uh, this chapter. It is not a belief, it is based on science and the global scientific community. Those of us with brains and thumbs, we have uh, been in agreement for a long time. So this brings us to the last one, or at least this next one. And that is, have we had a major success as a global community in regards to fixing an environmental problem? All right, now, usually I don't do this to y'all, this, this, but this, I, know how people are going to answer. So three people said yes, 11 people said no, 11 people are wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I don't always get to say that. Nor I don't delight in that. But in this case, it's good, right? 
So have we had a major success as a global community fixing a problem, a challenge, major thing in regards to the environment? The answer is yes. You are not 47 years old, however, so you might not remember what that is. What is that success? We had three people say yes. What do you think? Even if you didn't answer, what is that success? We have, as a global community, everybody, even the United States, come together, boom, solve something. This is another very positive thing because generally speaking, my students way perceive that we have not. And three to 11 would be that. What do you think? What is it? I'm gonna drink coffee while you hear this. Oh, a moment of silence for Alex Trebek. Oh man. It was always weird to see him without a mustache. All right, I digress. Time's up. What's the answer? Well, last week you mentioned about the aerosols um, that did help fix the ozone layer. So it's not completely fixed, but it's definitely a lot better than it was a decade ago, maybe. Good. I didn't know if I had mentioned that or not because we were just getting around to this question. Um, judging by people's answers, so it's still a surprise. Um, yeah, CFCs, chloral floral carbons. That was the smell of slow dancing in junior high to me because everybody had giant attack bangs like this coming off the front of their heads and it smelled like Aquanet. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the smell of junior high. Slow dancing was also the smell of uh, holes in the ozone uh, getting formed. And then looking at that a decade later as a global community, much repair. Um, so yes, we have had success tackling something as big as fixing a hole in the ozone. Um, so I think that we are more than capable as human beings of providing solutions to the challenges that face us in regards to our natural world that are tangible here on this planet. All right, let me switch to a screen share now. Okay. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, can you see that? Thumbs up, yeah, it's working, good. Um, or I hope, I didn't see any thumbs up, but I'm just gonna hope that that's okay. Um, all right, so do you feel like fixing the environment? Most of us are on board with that. Um, just real quickly, global warming, climate change, not a belief, I've already said that. It's a science, there's a very high confidence in that. It's not nine out of 10 anymore, it's well over nine out of 10. And we know why that is. So where do policy and fossil fuel addiction intersect? How about what is good for the environment? Uh, conflict intersect. How does our culture of consumption and privilege shape our natural world? So we live in a culture of consumption. We also live uh, as compared to the rest of the world. And we looked at that in the chapter on stratification with a great deal of privilege. So how does our consumption shape the world? Every time you buy a pair of jeans, every time you buy a car, every time you buy a coffee, every time, whatever that might be, every time you spend money, you're voting with your dollar for whatever that is. Um, and that is an important thing to keep up. Once Oprah had uh, the show about the uh, RG, is it? no, RGB, that's not RGB, the hormones in milk, which is really close to RGB. Um, and now I'm thinking about it at eight, whatever in the morning. Anyway, she did a program on that, the hormones in milk, and immediately the meat council sued Oprah. Like the Dairy Council sued Oprah because that's something you're not supposed to talk about. Uh, the growth hormones that could be present in your milk that they give through antibiotics to, um, or excuse me, not just antibiotics, but the growth hormone to cows. Okay, so the dairy producers of America sue Oprah. Who wins? Anybody? Make a guess? Dairy. <laughs> um, please, uh, please rephrase your answer in the form of English. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Baby dialect. I'm pretty sure she said, Oprah, baby. Yes, Oprah won. Dad, you're wrong. Oprah's got more money than the Dairy Council. Shoot, that's how it works in this country. Anyway, Oprah won. And the next thing you know, people did not want to buy that milk with that hormone at Walmart. And so Walmart almost immediately stopped carrying that milk. They are the single biggest grocers, right? We talked about that before, Sam's Club. And although they do use some of that money to undermine organic standards, they also, people voted with their dollar. They didn't want that, their milk. They stopped buying it. That's a vote. Walmart restructured the way that they ordered their milk. Okay, wow, that's a big deal. So um, change can happen for sure. We know it's getting hotter. We know that 
most of the last, I don't know, nine out of the last 10 years have been the hottest on record. Um, that's going back quite a ways, but that doesn't go back like is nearly as far as our ice core samples, right? Where we're going back 420,000, 500,000 years and looking at the amount of CO2 so that we can get an idea that our levels of CO2 are now much elevated past historical rates. We can go back though to around 1880s, um, a little bit before then. So I've got some like it hot, some like it hot. And then of course there's some like it wet. Uh, as you know, sea levels are rising and we're looking at the danger that this poses to, co uh, to coastal populations and islands. We've already had um, islands that are now not habitable in the last 10 years because of this. Um, these two things are important things to remember. And, and think about this. I am not for water privatization at all. I think that's a really, really big deal. We're gonna talk about that briefly. That being said, some, some people with an idea about money and profit and whatever, I don't care who it is, but somebody needs to start collecting this water in the billions of gallons that is melting off these ice shelves before it melts into salt water. I mean, the reality is right now, and I don't like it that it's melting, but it is. And so we are losing an opportunity at the very least to collect some of that water because of temperature rises. So, we, I mean, we've had 20 years ago, people were talking about tugging icebergs around and harvesting water. This is not some like weird water world futuristic, what a horrible movie, um, or Mad Max kind of a thing. This is all happening right now. So I don't wanna to take too much time on this, but we know this, right? There's been massive ecological dis uh, disruptions, whether that's coral reef, wildfires, we're in the sixth uh, mass extinction right now. And it is our problem. So it also makes it our solution. I mean, we do suffer from this directly, whether that's drinking water shortage, heat waves, drought stress, increased disease. You know, you, you ratchet the temperature up half a degree is all, and now you've got a hurricane season that is, wow, unlike anything we've ever seen, because that's energy, right? You raise the temperature, you uh, raise the amount of energy that drives these storms. So ag, same thing, drought in some regions, changing soil in some regions. Uh, a lot of that is due to poor watering and agricultural practices. Climate and human crises, heat waves increased, and I'm, I'm going to say disasters. And the reason that we just need to say disasters is, and, and you're, now that you're a professional sociologist after 15 or 16 weeks, you know why. Because if we say natural disasters, right, that puts that, puts that on the earth, right, instead of on our impact on it. So hurricanes, tornadoes, you name it, rising disease and health problems, Ooh, this is a slide, isn't it? Ugh, my goodness. Um, have we had a success? Now we know we have, okay? We have had success, and this is a while ago, granted. Um, but that means that we can succeed again. All right, so yes, I'm here to tell you this morning there's not just one ozone problem, there's two. Um, and we understand how this works, right? Um, as far as ozone protecting us from UV radiation, and our ozone holes. Now, too much UV light leads to increased skin cancer rates. What's that look like? If this is 2% or 5%, I do think that's still important statistically, but between 1994 and 2001, that's only seven years, skin cancer rates were up 66%. Okay, that's an issue at that point in such a small amount of time with such a high percentage driven um, piece. So it has the ability to damage immune systems, certainly disrupt ecosystems, massively. Um, and the reduction of the CFC production, it slowed the loss for sure. And now we know we can work together as a global community. But photochemical smog, ground level ozone, which is different, right, than the ozone up in the air, um, you know, still responsible for over, sorry, that's supposed to be 100,000, but 100,000 deaths a year. So it's still an issue, whether that's ground level ozone or whether that's, you know, protecting our planet um, and has some pretty big impacts for us. Particulates and acid rain. Um, again here, you know, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and a lot of these penetrate into lung tissue. So that's what it is. The damage is because people are breathing this in. We could call it photochemical smog or white smog. But poor fuel combustion, cars, power plants, wood stoves, um, outdoor burning of sulfates, nitrates, VOCs again, and of course, livestock fertilizer emissions, CAFO, large production emissions. Um, and a 2006 study found that over 160,000 Americans died prematurely. So these are all cited in Michael Carolyn's book, Society and Environment. 
Um, he is the dean of our social and behavioral sciences department, and I use his textbook. So it's really cool if you take my 220 class, because if you want to talk to the author, he's in the B wing of Clark. I mean, Michael's writing books on food and agriculture. I mean, the most mind blowing, super smart person. You should make a contact with him if you end up being in the social behavioral sciences. Um, and I think probably his traveling the world to New Zealand and all these other places like Michael does is probably slowed down a little bit. Um, but make contact with him. And this is where a lot of these, if you're wondering where these references come from, Michael Carroll in second edition, uh, Society Environment, a great textbook and even better to have the author um, on our campus, right? Um, all right, we've got threats to land, we've got threats to water. So here you're looking at salinization. So when you're watering improperly and it's evaporating at high rates, you get that salt buildup. And so, what happens each year is we get less land and less potable water. Um, and soil is eroding from farmland at at least a rate of 10 times faster than it can be replaced. So we'll talk about the agriculture or the treadmill of agriculture, um, but as agricultural lands and, and the size of these operation grows and farmers have to get bigger and bigger machines, um, and, and now we're using, instead of old school farming methods, pesticide application. We've got a loss of agricultural um, land also to land development. Um, so uh, we are faced with some pretty big issues as we look to the future of growing food. And I think the future of growing food um, is going to be on much smaller organic farms uh, that definitely have the capability to feed the world. A storm, chicken's all good. All right, that's your last chicken report of the semester. Are the chickens good? Eee, there you go. There's the, uh, the full report from my 15 year old this morning. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, drinking water, food, threats to food is one thing. Threats to our water is entirely another. We have to understand water is a completely finite and irreplaceable substance. It is totally unique. Furthermore, we don't know how much of it we have, but most of it, is salt water, right? Most of it is unsuitable for drinking. So, um, you know, water supplies, food supplies, deregulated, gen genetically modified it for our food made of non-food elements. But down here, municipal drinking water is almost no regula regulation on the federal level. So I mean that bottled water is a state by state piece. And most of that, you know, Dasani, Mount Everest. And I do have this funny, um, that Penn and Teller used to do a show called Bullshit where they look at different things and there's an episode that I used to show in my other class, the 220 about water. Um, but most of these, like all that fancy bottled water or just regular bottled water, however you see it, is produced in like Corpus Christi, Texas or Ohio in like, you know, industrialized zones where they're not even, I mean, it's, it's municipal water. You pay for it with your taxes. It is just taking a faucet, turning it on and bottling it and charging however many more times for it. So the problem is, and I've talked to water, uh, experts, um, there's a guy who does horse tooth. The water is different there than it is in Fort Collins than it is in Loveland. Those are all three very different water um, ways to get water for those communities. And these guys and gals, these, these uh, folks that are working that are water scientists are finding that it is impossible to get out the toxins and particularly the pharmaceuticals. So they're going to like a conference to another conference to another conference, three of these things a year. And he's like, Jason, you know, lead and arsenic are one thing, but the massive amounts of pharmaceuticals. And of course, if we look at the last 20 years, our pharmaceutical uh, usage has gone up a couple hundred percent, right? Plus, so at that same time, that's coming out of our bodies and into our water supply. Fish, you know, hermaphrodite, people who are not on birth control, not being able to have kids. Um, there's a lot of externalities for us as human beings as well. Somebody said in the chat, a book about bottled water and system. Yep, bottled and solid. Yep, good book. Um, Blue Gold is a little bit older documentary, but I think is really great. And it looks at water privatization. Like that's something we have to talk about, which is corporations owning our water supplies that have been municipal water supplies for all of mankind, all of like humanity up until the last 20 or 30 years. And what's that look like? So only 1% or less than 1% of the waters, uh, world's water is fresh water and is drinkable. Okay. So around 1%, but less than that, that's fresh water. A lot of that has been poisoned. So we don't know how much water we have. Uh, it's melting into the oceans from the ice caps and our underground aquifers, we have no idea. And we're putting our things like uh, fracking sites where we're re-injecting wastewater back into the well sites, back into aquifers, 
um, poisoning what we do have, but we don't know how much of that we have. So this is something that like for you and I to go open up a sink and just let it run while we're brushing our teeth, or I could just go right now and open up all the sinks and hoses in my house and let them run all day long and just, <laughs> right? And it doesn't seem that evil right now or that big of a deal, but you have to understand in less than 10 years, this is going to be a very, very, very important issue because none of us can survive without clean water for very long at all, right? So this is, I would say, a very paramount piece when we're looking at the environment. Water rights, uh, again, a big issue with this. And I know I'm kind of, I'm touching upon all these kind of big pieces here um, as I'm going through this chapter, but I want to get us thinking in sociological ways about, about all these things. Of course, you've got water and the amount of water is, is, is lessening while we've got population boom, right? So we obviously have a bigger need for water because we have more people that need to drink it. We're using more of it for farmlands. We're using much of it for cows, right? And to raise livestock. And that's where I'm pretty sure that all of us here are gonna be drinking in 10 years, though we may not be eating big juicy meat hamburgers. And that's because if it's, if it's me or that cow, sorry about that cow, that's gonna be me with thumbs drinking water. Um, so let's look at our water. It is valuable, it's finite, and it's an irreplaceable substance. All right, species loss. We know that that's increasing. And I look, I think it's very important. You can't go around killing whales that have 600 million years of DNA, or this turtle that has 200 million years of DNA. These are things that on the food chain are, I mean, whales are right here with us, right? And so many of these things are very high on the food chain. We don't know how important they are, even though we're losing them at a drastic um, and alarming rate. So it's really important to consider that piece that I talk about in here. Diversity is key, right? Human beings function better with more diversity. A river functions better with more diversity. You can't pull out two or three small things from that river and have it do the same thing, right? Have it function in the same way. So, um, these creatures that have hundreds of millions of years of DNA are being wiped out in decades or less. And this is something that we need to pay attention to. Um, there's very small things here. I'm talking biodiversity, whether we're talking about plants and mosses and ferns, whether we're talking about insects or big things like that polar bear at the beginning that was kind of clinging to the ice piece. We notice, generally speaking, when larger mammals or bigger chunks in our biodiversity die, um, but that does not mean that they are more important. Um, how our biodiversity functions is a combination of all of those things intricately woven together. All right, thumbs up. Well, you can give a thumbs down, but anyway, have, did you know about the Atlantic and Pacific garbage patches? In the past, many of my students have not. Um, <clears throat> now more of them do. Used to be areas that are twice plus the size of Texas. Now they are three to four times each the size of Texas. And they're just, I mean, you see, the, you see the guy here in the canoe. These are, these are gigantic areas in the middle of the ocean where the currents are you know, not moving so that they are settling. And, and we've got two big ones on the face of the planet. My friends live on Kauai, on Hawaii, and they say that walking on the beach for the last 20 years is difficult because so much of that plastic washes up on the shore and breaks up into small pieces. And if you've ever left a Frisbee outside in Colorado just for one summer, you can see how the sun breaks that down. It's so intense. So now it's, not, it's whales, it's other types of fish, um, but they're getting all of this plastic and stuff like that in their bodies, microplastics as they're breaking down. And we're finding microplastics in almost everything in the ocean that we test the stomach of and look at. So it's a big deal. Um, there are some really creative ways to look at disposing of this, but again, um, it's that out of sight, out of mind thing. We don't think much about prisons, right? Sociologically, the total institution. And the reason we don't think about that is because it's out of sight, out of mind. The same landfills and the same would be true with like our biggest landfills in the ocean, right? Um, same thing. So too many people, the, go to the population clock. If you look up the human or the governmental population clock, global population clock, it's really awesome because it's like, person being born, person being born, person being born, and finally somebody passes away, and person being born, person being born, person being born. We have a really quick uh, and sort of limitless right now um, upward trend. And here's what it looks like throughout history, right? 
all the way across. You know, it takes you a long time to get a, a long time to get a billion people. And then not much longer to get two. And here's to put this in sort of our terms, right? Like when John Kennedy was president in the 60s, the world population was 3 billion. It's now seven. Yeah. And I think 30 years after Kennedy was president, or by 2000, it was 6 billion uh, or almost. So, you know, when it's like this, this is resources. You have so much sun and that makes so much wheat and grows so much food. And so the global population doesn't change for a long time. And then you start to see um, migration. You start to see people farming. You see agriculture. Then you see mechanization. And, and then all of a sudden, right, you see science and health and, and medical science and things like that. So now, you know, it looks like, and if there's a really great guy, you can write down his name if you want. His name is Hans Rosling. If you're interested in population stuff, he's like the most fun guy. And he had his continuation passed a couple years ago, but Hans Rosling, and he has a couple lectures online that are like so cool. Visuals, like graphs and uh, holograms. And he really makes it interesting. And he talks about peak population and says that peak population will probably happen around 11 billion people. So if we're looking at something like water and population, although population seems to be really, really, really important, um, there's a lot of things to consider. All right. All right. So let's uh, take a look here at environmental justice. Um, we weren't really looking at environmental justice in detail until the early 1990s. Yes, a few things were going on in the 60s and 70s and 80s, not really picking up steam as far as big movements until then. But this is from my hometown of Freeport, Illinois. This is Burgess Battery Factory. And actually, it kind of looks like something out of, I don't know, Batman or something like that when you look at it. But um, this was right on the river, Pecatonica River. Um, and it was a dry cell battery manufacturing plant from 1926 to 1989. Now, if you know anything about dry cell battery manufacturing, it's about one of the most toxic things that we do. I, I don't know how many people have a box with batteries in them. I might've asked that already. I have this big box of batteries that I've had in my garage. It was in my last house. I wouldn't throw it away. It, like I still have it. I don't think that going to Best Buy, if I dump it, I feel like if they, if I take it to Best Buy, they're just going to take it out the back door and dump it in, you know, in a, in a bin anyway. But to do that manufacturing, it's like cyanide, asbestos, um, you name it. Um, lead seeping into the groundwater. So they had to close that plant in 89 because of environmental concerns. Then they had to remediate the site. They tried twice. And remediation is really just taking the soil from an area, digging down and moving it to a rural location. So taking all that contaminated stuff, getting it out of there, and then testing it. They did it once, did not work. They did it twice, did not work, decided to build a really big wall around Burgess Battery Factory. And there it sits today. And I'm sure um, that I can't even believe that it was still going up until 89. I graduated in 92. That's just wild to think. But I'm sure if you were to go there and test the dirt on the banks of that Pecatonica River or on that site, you would still find it um, to be very, very, very contaminated. So where, where is the trash dump in your town or the power plant or the waste treatment plant? In my town, it is literally on the other side of the tracks. In Freeport, Illinois, there's an east side of Freeport and a west side of the east side is poor white and almost strictly minority folks. And that is where, because there's also a flower plant that was put here, you know, around 1900 um, and the river got less wide. You put a couple factories on it. Now when you make the river, right, and you condense it, what happens? Anybody? That's right, it floods. So I don't know that there's a year every single year since I grew up in, in Freeport that the east side didn't flood. My dad's dad was riding a canoe to work because he was poor white and lived on the east side of town. And you know, when it floods, it floods and it's like Katrina. It's not just like water from the river. It floods all that sewage and pesticide and, and poison. I mean, it's, it's bad. And yet that's been happening since my dad's dad was working at a factory over there. It still happens in the year 2020. Nobody has done anything to prevent that from happening on the east side of Freeport. And why is that? It's for reasons that we talk about all the time, right? Power and access and who gets a share or a distribution of the environmental bads and the environmental goods. And we look at that as sociologists. I mean, normal folks are just looking at it every, oh gosh, the east side flooded again. Oh gosh, the east side flooded again. Oh, you know, 
<laughs> but we know, <clears throat> and this is quite literally, <clears throat> exactly literally in this case, that those with the least amount of power get the most pollution, meaning, and I said this before, who gets what comes downstream is not equal, okay? Um, those folks that are living the closest to these toxic output of our industrial economy, whether that's the folks in Greeley, whether that's folks in Chicago or Northern Indiana, those communities where those people live are oftentimes the people with the least amount of power, the poorest, the most disenfranchised in society. And the well-to-do and well-connected can avoid those worst consequences. I mean, think about it in Colorado and literally, right? You think of the other side of the tracks, that's Freeport. And then you think of, these are like old phrases, right? Like house on the hill. But if you look at Colorado, some of these people either don't work anymore because they're so wealthy or must have a helicopter to get to work every single day because these places are like so inaccessible. Well, that is literally avoiding the externalities of environmental problems, right? So environmental justice, um, we know about it. We know who's at risk. We know that they receive less social justice. And so as sociologists, we ask these questions. We don't, oh, that's interesting that those poor folks, their host floods every single year in Freeport. That's not what we do as environmental sociologists, right? We say, how do we change that? Does Colorado have to be on fire or California every single year? Um, how do we deal with that? How do we create more equality overall in society so that we lift people up so that there's not this environmental justice gap? Um, and who do we need to listen to so that we can accomplish this, right? I guess the last one, in the most simplest terms is how can we help people, right? How can we help people so that the impact of this is not so skewed? 1992 study of all um, found that 3% of all whites and 11% of all minorities live within a mile of a hazardous waste facility. Jason, 3% is not a lot. You're right, 3% is not a lot. But a factor of nearly four is a lot. So if we, again, if we flip this like that wealth gap, and it's eight to one European to African American. If we, it doesn't seem like a lot now because we're on, you know, if you're in dominant culture, you're on the upside of that. If you are in dominant culture, you know, the chance is only 3% where it's four times that if you're a minority. Okay, so that's the important factor there. Allie, did you have something? No? Cool. Um, so now a central civil rights in the United States. And this is during the Clinton administration, but Executive Order 12898 requires all federal agencies to work towards environmental justice. Now, it's important, but how do we interpret that? Obviously, this administration can't even admit what our scientists know, which is that it's occurring in the first place. If, if you won't admit as an administration that climate change is happening, how are you going to follow through with working on a federal level to make sure that you work towards environmental justice? You're not, and these agencies haven't been, they will be, but that doesn't mean over the next four years, um, again, that this, we don't know that this administration is going to pledge a whole lot of dedication towards the environment or not, right? So it's up to us to make sure that we look at that. Did you know that MLK was working for environmental justice when he was assassinated? Um, yep, working in the South, working in Memphis, uh, economic environmental justice, and he was down there, his mission at the time was working with, um, striking with black garbage workers for better pay, better working conditions. Um, and of course he was assassinated before he could complete his goals. But I think the important thing to remember is that I think we have kind of Dr. King on this sort of static pedestal, right? Like sort of this otherworldly, he's a human being. He has the same downsides as every human being and he has the same upsides and he has multi-dimensional, as multi-dimensional or more than any of us. So not just looking at civil rights, working conditions is a civil right, right? So I know we think of this broader picture, but MLK interested in environmental justice issues as well. All right, I love this, because this is easy. This is how we sort of split things up in social. Environmental goods and bads, I like that, right? Let's make it easier for us to understand it. Uh, the bads, hazardous and toxic waste, garbage and landfill sites, siting of hazardous industrial facilities, and these things are typically local in their impacts, right? They impact the communities that are least politically empowered, whether because of class, heritage, nationality. A lot of times, and I live in a rural location, a lot of times those are rural locations, so it's just not inner city places. It is also poor white rural places that get a majority of these um, toxic outputs. 
Um, and they have an impact where people work, right? Pesticide and food production. And I do not have those numbers in the slide. It's ridiculous. I don't know. It's, it could be 20 to 50 times more than that of people working in offices or working in different um, jobs. But pesticide and food production, the cancer rates through the, work, through the roof. And we also take dangerous jobs and we export them, right? To places where either people have little choice, there's um, a great deal of inequality or really lax environmental laws. Um, and I might, did I mention for our band, I wanted to, this is like, I don't know, six years ago, um, I wanted us to make sure that we had a recycled thing for CDs. I wanted all of our packaging to be recycled. And our guitar player who worked at a printing place was like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, definitely. Like, what? yes. And he's like, how do you know that that's better? And I'm like, I don't know, because recycling's better. <laughs> and he said, yeah, well, we take a lot of that. We send it to China. They have no EPA um, in many of those places or, or a very lax rules in some places of production. And therefore, the bleach and all the things that they, you know, recycle these, this paper with getting kicked right back out into the ocean. He's like, it's not necessarily true that that's a better option. So something for us to keep in mind. And again, I'm not saying we're going to be this equal, but like during stratification, do we need to be where you can't even see my hands? What are my hands doing? Is it show choir waving? Is it flipping everybody off? You don't know. I don't know. Right. We'll bring back down here. Oh, so, but we, so maybe like this, right? And this position didn't change at all, but we know that the richest fifth of the world's people command 66 uh, times as much of the world's income as the poorest fifth. They also use and consume more, right? And this poverty gap is increasing. The gaps between the richest and the poorest are increasing. Um, and so my question, uh, which is a rigged question, yes, but the question that I put out there would be as sociologists or as thinking about this, do things need to be this unequal, right? And I think that that's an easy answer, you know? And of course, people on top benefit when people down here have a little more, when they have healthcare, because then there's not billions of dollars of, of uh, detriment on our economy. Then there's, people are safer. Then they work more and they're not gone. They're in the job force, the workforce. Right now, it's all sort of all over the place, right? Um, but uh, I don't think things need to be this unequal um, at all. We have a consumption gap, right? The average person in rich countries consumes three times food, six times meat, 10 times energy, 13 times iron and steel. Then the average resident of a developing country. Um, we have a pollution gap, right? The wealthy of the world create far more pollution. I know I'm going kind of quick, but we consume more, we pollute more. So I'm asking, you know, if, you, if we have that responsibility and we live an average of 28 years longer than those in poor countries, that's, that's a ridiculous amount, right? 28 years, then what can we do? We've got a huge disparity in the ability of people to acquire the most basic needs like food, water, shelter, living a little bit longer. How do we do this? As people living in a wealthy country, as sociologists, how do we make sure that the quality of life or whether people live at all can improve. Um, and why? Because the environment is an issue of global concern, because we are a global community, because we are interconnected. Like I said before, through air, through water, through economies, through our natural world. So the stop share here, do we have responsibility living in a wealthy country um, to make sure uh, that people, let me see here, sorry, I'll read in a second. Do we have responsibility living in a wealthy country to make sure people in the world can acquire the most basic needs? 13 said yes, one said no. I think there's a lot of different ways to look at this. What do you think? Um, do we have responsibility living in a wealthy country to make sure that others in the world can at least survive? Why, why not? What do you think? I've been talking for a while, so I gotta take a break. And I don't think either one of these answers you know, or gradations of them means that we don't have compassion. If you say no, da 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 da, no one's judging you. Or if you say yes, whatever. Like, what do you think? Do we have responsibility? Why? No, we don't have responsibility, but we should. What do you think? Well, I think there should be some kind of accountability. Like, if you're one of those nations that is consuming more, well, then maybe you should have more responsibility into, you know, putting efforts back to restoring the environment or, you know, kind of like paying your dues in a way. 
Yeah, and I mean, obviously, we have a big impact. We have the capability economy-wise to be able to do that. And I, I like what you're saying. You know, let's talk about it in proportionate use because all the time this stuff gets put on you, right? What can you do? How many light bulbs can you change? How can you shut off your water? How can you whatever? Do you make the impact of General Mills or of some other Fortune 500 company that is polluting exorbitant amounts or dumping a lot of toxic waste into whatever that might be? Is that you, right? So I love the idea, um, Aaron, that we have to look at somehow if we have a disproportionate impact, how do we how do we like up our game as far as doing something about it? That only seems logical. Uh, now I know the world doesn't function always in a sense of, <laughs> or or the playing field of logic. That's okay. Sometimes we play on the court of total insanity. But you know, home game, away game, whatever, right? All right. What else? What else do you think? Um, do we have responsibility? Why or why not? Or how? I agree with the accountability piece. And I also think that, you know, being in wealthy countries, some of the measures that we can take to improve sustainability and take care of the environment are costly, you know, up front, um, though they benefit in the long run. But I mean, in a wealthy country, you have people that can absorb that cost, whereas in developing countries, you know, you don't really have that option as much. So I think the accountability and the accessibility is totally on us as a wealthier country and on other wealthy countries. All right, good. It's on us. We can do something about it. Why not? All right. Uh, other folks, any contrary opinions or any, any other ideas about this? I mean, I hear students all the time say no, because we have so many problems right here, like that we haven't addressed and that we haven't fixed. So why do we need to go around to the rest of the world um, if we can't take care of our inequality here within this country or the issues that we have to, you know, take care of. So I think there's a lot of different ways to be able to look at that. Um, but maybe somebody said it best the other day, which is we don't have to help, but we should. We're not required to, but we have the capability. So why wouldn't we, right? All right, let me do another screen share here for us all as we get into uh, the finals of this. All right, conspicuous consumption, conspicuous waste. All right, let's look at this. Now, as we wrap up, um, we really are looking towards a sustainable society and world, an ecologically sustainable culture. I like this, this is great. Could be on the test, I can't remember, but a way of life that meets the needs of the present generation without threatening the environmental legacy of future generations. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Like, I don't know that we have, we have all sorts of morals and mores and values and you name it, but I would love to see a driving directive for this country be towards the environment, be a way of life that meets the needs of folks right now without threatening the environmental legacy of future generations. That seems reasonable and just. Um, but again, without the Lorax to, you know, smack people around a little bit, who's going to make sure that this happens? <laughs> now I'm presenting the Lorax's enforcer. That's right. All right, strategies. So we know we've got to deal with population growth. That's a big deal. We know we've got to conserve our resources. That's a big deal. And they're finite, right? Look, our wind and solar power perfect alternatives? No. But you should rely, we should be relying, I'm, I'm a big proponent of solar power because once the sun is done, we're done. Unless you have a specialty bunker in the ground somewhere, Sam Walton, looking at you, um, you know, we're done. So we need to rely on energy that's, that we know is gonna be there. The sun is gonna be there. When the sun's not there, it's been a fun ride, folks. All right, reduce our waste. We know we need to do that. Developing new energies, absolutely. And this is a big, and I know these are all big things, we could spend an entire semester looking at the solution pieces, looking at up close, but we do need to, to do that, we're gonna have to reconstruct the way we interact and value our natural world. We are just absolutely gonna have to stop looking at it as what can we get from it, how often and never ending. Um, and we're gonna have to approach it in a different way. And this isn't just a bunch of tree hugging hippies that are gonna have to approach it that way. I know a lot of people that are very conservative hunters and fisher folks 
And those people need clean rivers to fish in. You want to fish on the Fox River like I do with my dad? You're going to have to do something about that agricultural um, pesticides that you put in the river that are killing the things that the catfish and the other fish eat, right? So we all have, I've actually, oftentimes I find that some of my most stringent self-labeled conservatives are some of the people that have the highest preserve the environment value, okay? So we need to know that this isn't a political issue, right? Dinosaurs dominated for 160 million years. Humanity, ooh, only 250,000, right? I mean, we've got intelligence. We've got thumbs. What are the chances that we're going to keep going? I like, <laughs> I love the far side. That's that, that's the, the, this cartoon. I think Gary Larson's coming back, but I love all the dinosaurs. It looks like they're smoking out and back of school or something. The real reasons the dinosaurs became extinct. I like how their like eyes are like looking out for people. But anyway, are we going to be here? Maybe even, I'm saying a thousand years. I'm not even saying, I'm saying we've been around for 250. Are we going to get 251, right? I'm not saying, are we going to even get a million? Are humans partially responsible for climate change, global warming? Whoa, sorry. Yes, we are. We know that. So here's my final point. I'm going to get up on my soapbox. Does it matter? It does not. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care what political label you put on yourself. I don't care. It does not matter. Everybody in this classroom, no matter who you voted for or what movies you like or whether you like Star Wars or whether you don't, I'm just going to let you know I don't trust you people. Anyway, no matter what, it doesn't matter. It does not matter who's responsible. Yeah, you're responsible. No, you're responsible. Screw all that. We have one Earth. So where's the denial? What, who, that only benefits a handful of people that want to get rich right now. Let's be real. Otherwise, we would change this. Like, people would admit to it. If we're still in that we have to admit that it's happening phase, we could be flat effed real soon. Okay? So to me, doesn't matter who's responsible. We only have one earth, right? And forget take care of her. Take care of it. Take care of he, she, it, her, they, them, this place, because we only have one earth. And this isn't like some emotional appeal. Maybe in another 300 years or 200 years, the Millennium Falcon is going to be zipping people all over this you know, universe. That's fine. Right now, no such luck. So Rocky Mountain Sustainable Living Association, there are some really great um, uh, organizations available to you. There's a Students for Sustainability on campus. They might be meeting virtually, I'm not sure. There are a ton of resources for you to get involved. And no, you don't need to strap yourself to my Christmas tree, put tinsel all over yourself and protest so that nobody cuts it down. It's already cut down. Just kidding. Uh, you, but but there's, a big, there's a big gap between like, and that's fine with me. Strap yourself to a piece of machinery and get arrested in the name of this earth. Be a Lorax. I think that's cool too. But um, we need to understand that this supersedes all of our political intentions, all of our beliefs and our biases, because it's the one way that we have and the one thing that sur survives and sustains us, right? So that's kind of where I'm at. I hate to think it's political. If you do want to know, and people, I do a whole chapter on political bias. And look, you want to know who values the environment and who doesn't politically? Go look at how they voted. That is the hands down, I think I already mentioned that, easiest way to do it. <laughs> You'll be able to get a real clear picture whether somebody gives a shit or not and what they have done or not about the environment and issues concerning our natural world. It's easy. You don't have to play political games and say that every Republican hates the environment and every Democrat is a tree-hugging hippie. We know that that's not the case, right? Um, but you can see exactly what people are, who people are, um, yeah. And and we've got we've got a we've got a, a big challenge ahead of us in this particular country in this particular culture. So we need more people plugged into that. All right. Okay. Um, I'm wrapping that chapter up. Here's the deal. Um, I, I know there's only 15 people here this morning, 14. Uh, and, I, and I will go ahead and release this to the rest of the people that watch in the class, but I wanted to give a heartfelt thanks. Um, oh, hey, before I give my sign off for the semester, uh, did you get emailed course evaluations? Has there been a link at all in your email for your different course evaluations or stuff like that? They used to uh, automatically embed it into the side 
of Canvas. So let me let me pull that up real quick. And um, you, uh, if you see it before I do, or something like that. Co okay, course survey. Yeah, course survey is there on the left. So take the course survey. Okay, like look. Oftentimes people say, love Jason, hate Jason. I've even seen people draw little stick figures of me hugging a tree. I like that. I'm into, I'm into that, I'm into that. Um, because you can't draw pictures anymore and it's just an online thing. Look, I value your input. I always wanna teach this class better. I always want people to major in SOCH. I want this to be like a bright spot of your week, even though, oh boy. Normally I swear a whole lot more in my conversations with people in the world than I do in class, which is great. It's a shit show. The world, it's a shit show. And right now everybody's just struggling to do their thing. And I want this to have been a positive experience for you this semester. If you see some way that I could like improve or change, I'm all about it. I'm absolutely all about it. If you like something, you know, the only way we know this is if you fill out a course survey. So take a few minutes, fill out the course survey, um, I get distracted when I see cute little babies. Uh, and um, although I'm glad that people haven't had puppies or babies. Can, can we see your baby ones? Ah, I just made my day 10 times better. Is that kid a ginger? Is that, is, no, okay, okay. I was, no, don't shake, no, don't shake your head like that. If that child's a ginger, they are gloriously blessed from birth. <laughs> that, that is my bias and actually, I am wearing a shirt that says Ginger Whale. I play in a duo, an acoustic duo that is the greatest band to ever play music ever. And it's kind of like Tenacious D for gingers. Whole lot of sunscreen jokes going on there and stuff like that. So if you want to check out a ginger centric thing that I do, that's, that's called Ginger Whale. Oh my goodness. Oh, and hey, <clears throat> let me type this once. And this is not so that uh, I can sell any by any means. Um, juliedowningart.com is the website for my partner, Julie. She's been doing her own artwork forever. She's got some amazing paintings and ink. So just go look at some fantastic art. She's got some really cool red rock prints and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, it's the holiday season. So I'm just sharing. My, my band's name is called Musketeer Gripweed. We just released our fifth CD. We're on Spotify and Apple Music. And, and if you go to YouTube, wherever you listen to music, type in, uh, let me see, hold on. That's the name of my band. We are everywhere. Yes, you can find videos of me rocking and rolling and jumping into the crowd. And, you know, I don't know. Check it out. I share these things with you at the end of the semester because you might be like, what? That was my teacher. Um, so check out uh, Julie's artwork if you want to look at some beautiful artwork. If you ever want to stop by our farm, our farm is called Ravensdale Farm. Um, and we're out here in Laporte. And, you know, if you want to look at the farm or the chickens, or if you're interested in the, the Social 220 class that I teach in the spring, I teach it every year. I do not have to advertise this class. It fills right away. Um, but if you're interested in taking a whole semester look at that, I do that as well. Um, yeah, I don't know if I usually I invite students at the end of the semester, come see a show. I don't know if, you know, I don't know when we're going to have our next show. Who knows? Last year we did a whole big, uh, Ginger Whale did a whole big thing where we uh, went in after hours to the mall and uh, recorded a music video with Santa. That's right. And then we were escorted out by mall security. So you can see that and a whole, <laughs> I'm sure that video exists on the ginger whale thing. Um, enjoy uh, any of that stuff. That's just art and music. That's what I do. Let me say this. Um, this has been a hard semester for me. It's been a sad semester. Uh, I'm carrying a great deal of grief about my mom. And so to be able to come here every Tuesday and Thursday and spend time with you people in a way that's joyous and what has been an otherwise um, very difficult past couple months for me as a human being, um, whoop, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that a ton. And uh, I don't know probably this semester if I would have gotten through without my students. And I never would have thought I would have said that. I've been teaching 15 years and I never would have thought that I would say that these awesome people who I work with are people that like got me through something really difficult for me. So thank you very much and uh, for being good people and doing good things. Um, I'm counting on you folks. I'm counting on you folks, okay? I'm counting on you folks to go out there and um, help, you know, lessen racism. I'm counting on you folks for like gigantic things. I know, I know it's a big deal. But go out there and make this world a better place. 
because that's your job as a human being. It's not just to, uh, you know, get what you want the whole time. So do good things, be good people, do good things. I'll keep you updated with our food drive. Our food drive is already getting close to 7,000. Uh, if we get $7,000, everybody gets at least 30 or 35 points and you've earned it for doing something awesome. So thank you for being my students this semester in the middle of the shit show, I, I guess I should say. Uh, it's been nice having coffee with you in the mornings and doing this class, but I'm not done yet. I'm here next week. We do not have class on Thursday. Um, the test will be open on Wednesday. I'm going to get offline right now and uh, I'm probably going to go cry for a while. <laughs> and then uh, and then I'm going to put up a study guide. Ugh, good gravy. <laughs> you have to know I cry at every Marvel movie. and Well, really, I, I'm a crier. So it's, 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 uh, it's something I'm okay with. And anyway, thank you, everybody. Peace. Reach out to me. I'm not done. I'm not done being your, uh, you know, spiritual guide through the world of sociology. Um, I'm here next week. If you have a question about something that's graded, a test question, your paper, or... Jason, how can I get involved with the social department? Um, because I'm telling you that the people in this department are smarter than me. They have done more impressive things in this life than me, and they are awesome. So if you thought this class was cool, you have, you have a, lot of, a lot of awesome education that you could go forward um, with, uh, with people in this department and, 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 you know, this college as well. All right. I hate to sign off. I'm, I'm milking it because I love this class. And uh, yeah, now I get to go spend another four to six weeks locked down in my house with my boys, just like I did for the last nine months. I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> I can do it. Um, so no class Thursday. Also, <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> yeah. Well, tis the season, I guess. Uh, all right, everybody. Be good people and do good things. Thanks. Reach out. Don't make this last. Hey, see you later, kiddo. Peace. Thanks for sitting through all these lectures. Peace, everybody. Take care. Love y'all. Be good people. I know you already are.